May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. It would be fair to say that I have an unusual preparation for the job I now have, maybe even a little unorthodox. Now, don't worry, I passed the ordination exam. I went to divinity school, but the best theological education I ever received, I got from spending five years of my life running a behavioral science laboratory at a university. I got to work with really smart people who designed experiments to help explain why we predictably do things, make decisions that either are not in our interest or just plain mistaken. Those five years caused me to question pretty much everything I ever learned studying economics. The world that economics describes is made up of people who are always looking to get the best for themselves. That is, after all, the rational thing to do. Most of economic theory has been built on the rational actor model of behavior, right? And in that model of the world, everyone is looking to maximize their utility. That's the phrase. That world makes sense at least in our heads. You know, maybe there's even something we prefer about it because we want to think of ourselves as rational people. We think of ourselves as rigorous thinkers who make reasoned choices. The problem is, more often than not, we're not. We fall prey to cognitive biases. We make predictable errors in judgment. And there are some things about the way we make sense of the world that just don't make sense. Think, for example, about this. Let's say we had a room here filled with 100 people. And we gave each of them an envelope with a slip of paper inside. And the slip of paper inside, when we asked them to pull it out and read it, says this, you are a worker in a technology firm and your salary is 100,000 euros a year. In your unit where you work, the average salary is 150,000 euros a year. Now, 100,000 euros? That's not bad, right? If you were here last Sunday, you know that's more than twice the average annual wage in Germany. In case you haven't been here for a while, we're conducting a small economic seminar here during CTK's service. That's not so bad. But now imagine that you give those same hundred people another envelope. And when they open it, they find another slip of paper. And that slip of paper says, there is another unit in your company for which you are qualified to work. The average annual salary in that unit is 80,000 euros. And you can move there if you'd like, but then your salary will be 95,000 euros. And at the end, you give those 100 people the choice. Stay where you are or move. Now, what do you think happens? Well, it turns out that if you do that experiment again and again and again over a large period of time, a little less than half the people decide to move. It's true across genders, across ages, even across cultures. Why is that? It turns out that pretty consistently, that's the choice that people make. Rational choice is one thing, but our happiness is a very different thing. And it turns out that our sense of happiness is a lot more connected to the relative differences that separate us from other people than to the absolute differences that we enjoy. Say it in different words. We make the mistake of measuring our absolute worth as human beings based on the small relative differences between us and other people. And it gets worse because the worse off we feel 
relative to everybody else, the more likely we are to choose outcomes, to vote for things that will reduce other people's well-being, even if we know it will cost us our own well-being, too. We can be very petty and small. Here's the last piece of that story. Of course, we don't just live with choices like this, right? We make sense out of them by wrapping them up in a moral rationale. We want there to be a connection between our relative place in the world and our deserving. And not too surprisingly, we want to be more deserving than others, which means we often explain our right to our place in the world by saying that others are less deserving. All right, so much for the lab. Now what about the gospel? Well, yes, part of the connection here is about the way in which those workers who showed up early in the morning and worked all day long in the heat of the sun are angry about their relative worth. They feel cheated out of something, even though they got exactly what they had been promised. The relative difference between how much they worked and how much the late arrivals worked is for them a question of deserving. Those workers didn't deserve what they got. That's what they see. But the point of the story that Jesus is telling is that their obsession with deserving completely misses the whole point. Whenever Jesus opens a parable with these words, the kingdom of heaven is like, you can bet that what is about to follow is a side-by-side -side parallel of the world as it is and the world as God thinks it should be. These stories are not meant to tell us a little bit about the world that we're coming into. They're not meant to prepare us for the life after this life. No, 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 no. They're meant to help us understand how in God's plan things ought to be done on earth as they are in heaven and how to change things now to make it that way. The pivot of this whole story is this complaint. You made them equal to us. How dare you do that? How dare you fail to see how deserving we are and how undeserving they are? What matters, landowner, is the difference between us, right? And that difference makes us more deserving. But that is the mistaken way we see it. Because, of course, the story is not about daily wages, right? It's about human dignity. It's about the essential, absolute worth of every human being. It's about our fundamental equality in the eyes of God's love. Brothers and sisters, we are hardwired as human beings to evaluate, to rank, to assess, to calculate our place relative to others. God made us and God knows that about us. And God knows it is exactly the thing that gets us making mistakes every day. René Girard, the French theologian of the last century, he saw this deep in human nature and described it as mimetic desire. We are more motivated, more resentful, more envious about something that someone else has and we don't than we are about something we already have to enjoy. If I don't have a car, and I don't have a car, if I don't have a car, I don't really care what kind of car you drive. But if I have a Renault, and you drive up to church in a Bentley, something about you suddenly bothers me. On that simple fact, deeply planted in human nature, hangs so much misery and prejudice and stupid hatred and war. We want to control this on our own terms by determining deservedness. That is what we think justice means. 
We want to tell the giver of gifts just how to give those gifts. You shouldn't give to that charity. My cause is way more deserving. You shouldn't help that person. They're not nearly as deserving as we are. We want to tell God just how to distribute the scarce resource of human dignity in ways that align with our take on deserving. But thanks be to God, oh, thanks be to God, God does not take our advice. And that just might have something to do with why the Christian message is having a hard time of it today in cultures driven by consumerism. Friends, there is a connection between this story and the highest ideals of our democratic societies. There is a connection between this story and language like, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all people are created equal. Equal. There is a link between this story and language like, men and women in Germany shall have equal rights. The Grundgesetz, Article 3, Section 2. We look out at the world and what we see is this is obviously untrue. People are obviously not equal. People have different physical capabilities, different social capabilities, different intellectual capabilities. We think all of that must somehow translate into what we and everyone else deserve from this life, what respect we deserve, what dignity they deserve. But God looks at the world, and what God sees is, they are all equal to me. I love them all equally. I gave myself for them all equally. They are all equally deserving, and that bothers us so much. Our insistence on deceiving ourselves blocks our path from walking the way of God's love. And even worse, it makes us resentful of God's way. But is not God permitted to do what God chooses with the abundance of God's love? And if we are truly disciples, then shouldn't we love the people around us, not according to our idea of deserving, but according to God's idea? of their deserving and their dignity. Think about that the next time you see the stories from Lampedusa. Think about that the next time you see the stories from the Channel Coast or the Rio Grande in America. Think about that the next time you hear a politician appealing in the worst way to our distorted sense of deserving by arguing that there are those unworthy of our charity and care. Think about that the next time you see someone living on the street caught in the grasp of mental illness or addiction. And then remember whose you are and which kingdom you pledged yourself to be part of in your baptism. So let us pray. Grant, O oh God, that your holy and life-giving Spirit may so move every human heart that the barriers which divide us may crumble, suspicions disappear, and hatreds cease, and that our divisions being healed, we may live in justice and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <laughs>